Welcome to Babblecom 5. This is episode 16 of season 3 of Babylon 5, War Without End, part the first. Our first views of Minbar, if I remember rightly, very clean, very ordered, almost crystalline, waterfalls and birds. I mean, Bari catches up with Entel Zar, holding a box that has been kept in a sanctuary for over 900 years, only to be opened on this day. In it is a paper envelope with Sinclair's name on it. And the hooded figure of Entel Zar is, of course, Sinclair, who now pushes his hood back to reveal his face. The Minbari is almost anxious, wondering how he knew Sinclair would be there, then for this message to reach him from so long ago. On the station, Corwin is picking up a distress broadcast from Sector 14, where Babylon 4 reappeared three years ago. No discernible source aside from the general area. If one of her listens shocked, as the voice on the transmission is her own, and someone is killing people on Babylon 5. On Minbar, Sinclair is preparing to leave and thanks Raven for his trust, for helping in the creation of the Rangers. He tells him to continue his work, come what may, and takes his leave. A Vaughan we have never seen before comes to Ruthin and says Sinclair is the closed circle returning to the beginning, when Ruthin says he feels that he will not see him again. The Vaughan does not respond when asked what beginning he is referring to. On the station the transmission is replayed. It's been confirmed as Ivanova's voice but she has no recollection of making such a distress call. Garibaldi adds an addendum, yet. Ever since he and Sinclair helped get the crew off Babylon 5 in Sector 14, the area has been messed up. He recalls a flashback he had of a firefight in which something was invading Babylon 5 and they were losing badly. He says given his experience, he should head out and try and figure out what's happening as Sinclair isn't around. Sheridan agrees, noting it's a three hour trip there in normal space. As Garibaldi prepares to leave, Zack greets a new arrival. Ambassador Sinclair is back aboard the station and does well to recognise Zack as they hadn't known each other very long before he left. When asked how long he might be staying, Sinclair smiles and says that's a more interesting question than he might imagine. Garibaldi takes off, saying to Ivana that if he manages to get winning lotto tickets, he'll split the proceeds with her. Lanier enters Delenn's darkened quarters to report on Sinclair's arrival. Delenn lights a candle and intones we are grey. We stand between the candle and the star. She wishes she had more time with her friend, but Lanier says this must be done and Delenn agrees. She is also in receipt of a paper note with her name on it. As Marcus and Sheridan discuss a pause in the Shadows campaign after the Volan intervention last episode, Delenn enters the war room and says they, Ivanova and one other are needed on the White Star immediately. The other is Sinclair who enters from the opposite doorway and greets Sheridan warmly. They last met during riots on Mars, but of course they know each other by reputation too. Just as they're exchanging greetings, word comes in from Garibaldi that the rift in Sector 14 is twice the size it was before, because it's being fed energy from Epsilon 3, the planet below Babylon 5. And a certain Zathras is concerned about how the great machine is holding up, but he tells his colleague that they cannot tell Drowl because it's taking all his concentration to keep the time field stable. Disturbing him would have dire consequences, but he told Zathras what needed doing, so Zathras will get on with it. Garibaldi has arrived at the rift and is probing it as best he can as more transmission fragments come through. On board a shuttle, Sheridan is also probing Sinclair as to why there was no warning of his arrival, yet Delenn was expecting him and is requiring them to go to the White Star in a hurry. Sinclair tells him there are no such thing as coincidences, and Marcus chuckles, saying that on Minbar, Ranger 1 was famous for his cryptic pro proclamations, best interpreted in a mirror whilst hanging upside down. Garibaldi continues to investigate the rift, cutting his life support to lock onto the signal with more power, but doing so brings a grim transmission from a wounded Ivanova on a wrecked CNC command deck, putting out an SOS to any ship in Grid Epsilon. The defence grid is down, the station has been boarded, and Garibaldi has rigged the fusion reactors. The external cameras show a shadow armada closing and establishing weapons lock before she cries out and a bright light fills the screen, cutting to static. Aboard the White Star, Delenn asks John if he trusts her. He doesn't understand why she's asking it and says yes with his life, 
and so she bids them all sit as she shows them footage from a thousand years ago that no one outside the Grey Council has ever seen before. She explains that the shadows were pushing hard and destroyed a great star base that the Mimbari were reliant on for long-range support. With that defeat, the war might have been lost or stalemated, but Droll has now sent her more footage. Babylon 4 arrived in the past as a replacement for that lost star base to the surprise of all present, if one of us saying they had assumed Babylon 4 was being taken into the future because it had gone forward in time when they encountered it. Sinclair says they never found out who was behind it moving through time when they helped get the crew off. Delenn now shows them additional footage from six years ago, just as Babylon 4 was going online. The Allies of the Shadows recognised the station from the past and sent fighters with a bomb to destroy it, but they were stopped by the White Star. Sheridan and the others get to their feet in shock. How? Delenn explains that Epsilon 3 is enlarging the rift so they can take the White Star back to save Babylon 4 and take it further back to where it is needed. Failing to do so will result in Babylon 5's destruction in the present. Breath. So, at the end of the last war, the shadows were driven from Zahadum and much of their fleet destroyed. If they don't get Babylon 4 in place as was done last time, the shadows dig in with three times as many ships, resulting in them being unstoppable in the present. It's already been done, they just have to do it again, for the first time, now. Entelzar is on board, as is Marcus, because Entelzar is on board. Ivanova apparently will be in the car. Sheridan eventually agrees. Sheridan contacts Garibaldi, who confirms that the timestamp on the message he's been recording is eight days from now. Sheridan orders him home as they're on it. One more surprise. They're being chased by a ship from Epsilon 3, which Delenn says she's been expecting, because even the Minbari lack the ability to stabilise a time field of this strength. They need to place a beacon on the power plant of Babylon 4 to be able to move it through time. This equipment is being brought not by Dral, who is busy with the great machine, but by another, one Zathras. Sinclair of course recognises him from the events of Babylon Squared, but Zathras hasn't met him yet, but knows he is the one, and we are reminded in flashback of their first meeting, which prompts Sinclair to warn Zathras not to reveal anything to his younger self. Zathras doesn't really understand, but says he is good at doings, if not understandings. He also has a list of things not to mention, like the one. But he's forgotten well what else is on the list, although it's apparent that Sheridan is on it, because he's honoured to meet him, but can't say why. It's a funny exchange. Sinclair asks Sheridan for a favour. As they pass Garibaldi, Sheridan doesn't tell him Sinclair is there, and confirms he's re to return to the station. Sheridan then asks if Sinclair wanted to speak to him, to which he responds, more than you can imagine. Marcus tells Sheridan he told him. Sinclair watches Garibaldi's fury go past on a display, and flashes back to his own flashback from Babylon Squared, where Garibaldi was making a last stand against the invaders. He promises in the present that he won't let it happen. Arriving at the rift, Zathras hands out time anchors to the crew, without which they can become unstuck in time due to the tachyon impulses they'll be subjected to. He says being unprotected against the impulses can also cause great harm, hence why the first Fury pilot in Babylon Square died of old age. They go in, the White Star appearing distorted by the timey-wimey distortion, until they come out on the other side and pick up the shadow fighters guarding what seems to be a fusion bomb they plan to attach to the station to make it look like its destruction is an accident. On the station, Zack greets Garibaldi and mentions that Ambassador Sinclair was there, which of course surprises Garibaldi, who discovers a password protected message on his system. In space, three shadow fighters break off to engage the White Star. One is taken out on approach, the other two evade and open fire, hitting but not damaging the White Star, which Lanier says has evolved its roll on organic skin to the point where it can dissipate the energy of their shots. Sheridan orders them to proceed towards their primary target. Garibaldi tries sock, fasten, zip, remembering his conversation with Sinclair in Babylon Squared, then tries hello old friend. Sinclair explains that he won't be coming back from Babylon 4, and if Garibaldi had come along, he wouldn't have either, and he couldn't allow that. But he wanted to say goodbye at least. In space, time grows short, and everyone of has to try targeting the bomb manually in the hopes of landing a long-range hit. She kills another fighter but misses the bomb, putting it in range of the station and them when she fires again. This time she hits, 
but the White Star can't clear the blast radius, and Sheridan's time stabilizer is hit by an energy discharge. His fragments remain as he fades off the White Star's bridge. Zathras warn, but no one listens to Zathras. Everyone else is okay. Sinclair pulls them all together. Sheridan may be retrievable, but right now they have to focus on the mission at hand, whilst Babylon 4's sensors are still EMP blinded. As they approach the station, and we see Sheridan drops to the floor with arms bound behind his back, then get kicked in the gut. One of the men says that he's awake and asks someone if they'd like to see. The guards concerned are Centauri, and as Sheridan is dragged to his feet, he focuses on someone, and we see an older Londo, dressed in white and gold with greyed hair, sitting on a red back chair in a room full of drapes. Londo says his timing is exceptional, just in time to die. Sinclair and Delenn exchange some words in Minbari, Sinclair reassuring her that Sheridan will be alright, that he knows how this goes, and has never been clearer about his life than he is right now. On Centauri Prime, Sheridan is confused by what's happening and Lundo accuses him of neglect. That he fought his war with the Shadows, yes, but so what if some of their allies had plans for the Centauri? Dragged through a window, Sheridan looks out on a planetscape in flames, apparently the consequences of this neglect. The White Star latches onto Babylon 4's hull and Sinclair organises the team. Marcus and Ivanova will secure a main corridor for them to use, whilst Zathras, used to being a beast of burden, will ferry equipment to the power core. Sinclair and Delane head off in a different direction. Oh yes, all the way back to Babylon Squared, and it turns out Epsilon 3 can pack quite the punch when it needs to. It was pretty much universally assumed as time went on that Babylon 4, having appeared into its own future, was following that direction of travel to be used in a future war. In fact, that was JMS misdirection, and it was actually going the opposite way to help in a much older war that informs the direction of the current struggle with the Shadows. That, you see, is planning. And JMS managed to get Michael O'Hare back for this, which is also remarkable in light of his real life struggles. Yet you'd swear he hadn't been away a day. Seeing him together with a transformed Elen and Sheridan is just terrific. And there's a scar on his cheek suggesting he's been through something along the way too. And of course we see there's a Volon on Minbar in an advisory capacity. Completely different in countersuit to Kosh's. And the first non-Kosh Volon we've ever seen in fact. Obviously now would be an excellent time to go back and revisit Babylon Squared. There are flashbacks here for the uninitiated and they are needed and timely because we're talking about two years between these episodes. Even the dedicated followers would be forgiven for missing some memories after that long. And yes, this is essentially a trilogy we're looking at here. A time travel adventure over two years of series time, but a lot more in the overall time span of the series universe. And that's the kicker here. This is where you could only possibly have pulled this off with this degree of planning that JMS has put into the show. Because Sheldon lands in the future. He gets split off from the main group after they've stopped Babylon 4 from being destroyed. So logically, he now lands in a future which is a likely outcome from the natural course of events in the series. And it seems that in that future, he may have won the Shadow War, but Centauri Prime has paid a price for that war, and an older Londo now appears to be the Emperor of whatever is left of the Centauri. So the question is, Will Sheridan remember what he learns here and be able to use that going forward, or would that impact things? Whoever sent Sinclair and Delenn their information was clearly careful to time lock it until a particular point, but Sheridan hasn't received any instructions that we're aware of, so we don't know if he'd do the same thing if he does retain this future knowledge. It feels a little quantum leapy in, in the sense that he's him, but he's jumped into himself in the future, so will appear confused to those in that timeline. So far, so logical, really, which is a rare thing for time travel, even if the whole thing seems a bit of a predestination paradox. Although the timing makes sense, because if in eight days the station would have been destroyed had they not gone back, then they had to go back now to effect the change that prevents the station being destroyed at that point. And they can only know that timing if the rift in time has already been formed as a result of their saving Babylon 4. So yes, it's circular as all hell, but basically they're playing out history rather than altering it. They go back because they've always gone back. Mind fragged? Abzofrag and Speaking of which, 
I should mention Ivanova's video feed here because it is quite harrowing seeing Susan so clearly distraught and hopeless with the captain gone and hurting into the bargain. You can also see how that impacts Garibaldi too. Meeting Zathras again is funny, of course, although we knew he was down there from when Delenn and Sheridan spoke to him, um, or spoke to Drahl rather, earlier in the season. His point of view, of course, is that this is his first time meeting them, and he's just such a glorious comedic character that you have to laugh. Also makes you wonder how many other helpers Drahl has. Also the first time we've ever seen a ship come up from Epsilon 3 that hasn't gone first, hasn't gone, hasn't first gone down, suggesting that Drahl can send agents out if he needs to, which is interesting. We see the White Star having become essentially impervious to shadow fighter hits, which is handy. It also suggests that any damage the White Star takes it can learn from if it doesn't get destroyed by it. So it's no surprise that it should be pretty hardy by this point because it's been subjected to various energy discharges and engaged shadow fighters and ships of, and ship of tears. We also know quite clearly now that there is a docking bay on the White Star that's used to bring crew and cargo on. Not sure of the overall dimensions of the ship, but clearly it can carry auxiliary craft on this basis. Sinclair obviously remains very protective of Garibaldi, and it's clearly difficult for him to completely ignore him aside from this message to him, but it's apparent that Sinclair feels this is a one-way trip for him, and that's not a fate he wants Garibaldi to share. The two had a very close bond, and you can see the confusion on Garibaldi's face when Zack tells him Sinclair was there, but he's somehow missed him. Tough call to make, but Sinclair has obviously been fed a fair amount of information from someone in the past to give him this level of certainty about it, about what he needs to be doing and why he needs to be on this mission. So, I'll just mention Londo briefly. We don't see a lot of him, but clearly he's in the typical Emperor regalia here, which would fulfil a prophecy point. Um, we've also seen this aged version of him in flash forwards before now. Clearly he has beef with Sheridan in his future reality. And Sheridan appears to be at his mercy, which is just as confusing for us as it is for him. So, obviously the next episode will see the modern crew on the earlier station at the same time as the events of Babylon Squared from Season 1, when the station was in the process of being moved through time. Which is also a nice move, because it means that if you did have Babylon F Squared taped at the time, yes, VHS tape, digital recording on the thing at that point, you had chance to refresh your memory before the second part. I would certainly suggest that you go back if you'd like to, if only to see just how well or not they managed to mesh it together two years down the line. And next week I will then look a little deeper into this as a, a two-parter when spoilers will not be an issue. As it is, I'm keeping my cards close to my chest when this could be a far longer examination when all is said and done. Don't forget too, in case you're wondering, Franklin has resigned at this point so of course he's not involved here. And here I shall leave you. Second part should be my last one before Christmas. Bye for now.